plastic bag is full. We throw it into the nearest landfill. It's out of sight and out of mind. What is the state of our humankind? And I don't know what to say. Cause we part too smart every day. And we call it garbage. Today on Going Green for Green, the theme is sustainability. Pretty vague word, but essentially what it is, is about maximizing the resources that we've already taken from the earth. We're gonna be talking to some business leaders, specifically the Minister of Environment, with respect to, to what the ministry's doing to promote sustainability, as well as looking at some people in your communities that are making a big difference in their own lives, uh, making their homes and their families and their communities more sustainable. We find ourselves in Kingston, Ontario, the reason being, Kingston is laying claim to be Canada's most sustainable city. We've been in Kingston before with Queen's University, St. Lawrence College, a lot of offices for the Ministry of Environment. Kingston is definitely one of the more environmentally conscious cities in this country. The Kingston Sustainability Centre is actually a storefront dedicated to promoting businesses and lifestyle choices that, that promote sustainable living. Randy Clough is the gentleman that actually spearheaded the launch of the Kingston Sustainability Centre and John Gerritsen, the Minister of Environment, is here to actually cut the ribbon and officially open the doors today. Sustainability to me primarily means, you know, we have to use the resources that are out there that we need for our living today without taking from the future. And for too long, for too long, we as a society, and we've benefited too from it as well, over the last 200 years, have simply taken way too much from the natural resources that have been given. The burning of the fossil fuels that have created our climate change issues of today are real, and if we don't start doing something about it, at both the international level, but also at the local level, the kind of society that the older folks in the crowd have known over the last 50 years or so simply will not be there for the generations to come. The new Green Energy Act is about one thing and one thing only, and that is to bring renewable energy projects, whether we're talking about wind power, sun power, solar power, biomass or biogas, on stream. And you know why we want to do that? Because they don't burn fossil fuels. We simply have to wean ourselves off the burning of fossil fuels. collaborative opportunity here and there has been a couple of real key folks and in, in organizations and businesses that have stepped up to help us here one is Brown's Fine Foods and specifically Philip Brown the president and CEO and certainly without his kind and generous support in offering this piece of real estate to us we wouldn't be standing here today so certainly thank you Philip I think uh, the schools themselves as well St. Lawrence College the Limestone District School Board and the Algonquin District School Board have been fabulous in terms of engaging with us, integrating, look at opportunities that we provide in terms of their youth and their students being here, putting things into the curriculum and really being our true partners. So we certainly want to thank them as well. Tremendous amount of uh, energy around a lot of the not profits in the uh, area as well. Certainly uh, we have a wonderful uh, sponsor here, here in Renewable Energy that del delivers renewable energy solutions. Companies like Western Landscaping very much focused on our landscape environment and how we can make that more in tune with our natural processes of the environment. Uh, certainly Utilities Kingston, another wonderful partner and sponsor. So the community has really embraced us and they've really seen the power that we can deliver by engaging youth to be the agents of social change. The Kingston Sustainability Center, is, as Randy had mentioned earlier, is about youth leadership and about empowering youth to affect change in our communities so that we live with uh, more environmental consciousness and more environmental awareness. Dan, who is the uh, manager of the Kingston Sustainability Center, has a very unique education. And in speaking with Dan, I thought that the viewers here might be interested to hear where he's been educated and, and how that transpires. Dan, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, Mike. Tell us a little bit about and how, uh, I guess, your background differs from, from those graduated from Queens or other uni universities in Canada. Yeah, it's a bit different. Actually, I started off, uh, I went to Royal Roads uh, University in Victoria, British Columbia. I did a Bachelor of Education, or a Bachelor, sorry. I did a Bachelor of Commerce in Entrepreneurial Management. From there I learned about what business and sustainability means, right? And I also had a link to a Swedish uh, university. At that point I went to Sweden uh, at 
to a Blecking Institute of Technology and did a master's in strategic leadership towards sustainability. I mean really the big picture of what's going on. And there are some things we just can't do. So many things in nature are cyclical and what we've developed in a lot of ways is a linear thought, right? And when it comes down to it, there's some things we just can't do in the ecosystem. So from that point, I studied in Sweden with 17 different nationalities, uh, points from all over the world. One of my best friends, one of my roommates is Chinese. I mean, so you get a different perspective from different problems from different countries, right? So you learn a lot, not just from the program itself, but interacting with different people from around the world. So it's almost a global approach to sustainability that they teach in Sweden. For sure, and I mean, well, this, this institute anyways, right? Uh, when it comes down to it, it's not just Canada, it's not just China, it's not pointing fingers. I mean, we come to a point with population and resource declining that we actually have to work together on this. Check us out online at www.goinggreenforgreen.tv or follow us on YouTube, Facebook and Twitter. Going Green for Green is brought to you by Ontario Electronic Stewardship and RecycleYourElectronics.ca. So here we are today um, with Deborah Doncaster, who is the head of the Community Power Fund um, and is a really a, a, a driving component in renewable energy and in the feed-in tariff program, which is being discussed today at First Canadian Place in Toronto. Uh, Deb, thanks for taking the time to chat with Going Green for Green today. Uh, give us a little rundown. Tell us your history. Uh, Deb's also responsible for the big windmill on the waterfront, the, one of the first ones in Canada. So she's got a long history here and she's going to sum it all up for us in a couple of minutes. Okay, I'll do my best, Mike. Thanks okay. for having me on the show. No problem. Um, well, I started my career in renewable energy about 12 years ago with the idea of building a community-owned windmill on the waterfront and the energy market was about to deregulate in Ontario that would allow for new forms of ownership and new generation technologies to come in. So it was an opportunity for communities to do projects as well as do windmills and not just coal plants in Ontario. So the biggest challenge was where, who do we sell our power to? So we initiated a campaign for a feed-in tariff, um, which is a, the mechanism used in most European countries to drive renewable energy. So rather than competing for a contract, if you meet all the milestones of developing a project, anybody can get a contract and feed power into the grid and be paid a reasonable return on investment. So the key is you say our grid is open for business, you provide priority access to the grid for renewable energy technologies, and you guarantee the right to connect. So the grid access issue is the, is the first component, and then the second component is, and I will pay you a 20, on a 20-year contract, the cost to build your project plus a reasonable return on investment, and that's what I'll pay you for every kilowatt hour of electricity you put into the system. So it allows a homeowner to put up a solar panel, a farmer to put up a wind farm, or a private sector company or utility to put in a mega project, and they all are under the same rules and get, make the same return on investment. So we put our heads together and said, let's push for a Green Energy Act for Ontario that would deal with the grid issues, deal with the permitting issues, and deal with the procurement issues that weren't working under the current FIT program. The, what's the cost to put that project in the ground and what's a reasonable return on investment. And so you set the tariffs, generally speaking, for let's say for example for wind, you'd have an onshore wind category and then you'd have an offshore wind category. For solar, you'd have a, a residential price would be different than say a large wind farm or a large solar farm where they, there'd be an economy of scale for doing a bigger project. So each project gets a different tariff depending on size and capital costs. Well, I'm, I'm in Canada because uh, Ontario gets it. Ontario is making it happen. It's the first political jurisdiction in North America that really has the intent to make this work. This is an idea that's been tremendously successful in Europe, and Ontario is bringing it here to North America. And I hope once Ontario does it, we Yankees will do it too. So, uh, and, and exactly, uh, you know, as a tariff expert, so is, is your role to sort of review the various technologies that are being employed in renewable energy and analyze the break-even analysis and develop the, the payback margin? Well, that's part of it, but part of my role is also is to bring the idea, this European idea, to Canada and to the United States to show that this is the way to develop the massive amounts of renewable energy that we need. And not only that, it's the best way to allow everybody to participate from homeowner to farmer to First Nations to corporations to develop the wind energy, the solar energy that we need, not only in Canada, but in the United States. So uh, this would be a really supporting decentralized power and, and multi providers of energy across the board and not just single point of production, but literally 
uh, power coming from all, all over. Well, feed-in tariff can do both, actually, but the beauty of the feed-in tariff is it does allow distributed generation by encouraging homeowners and farmers and all others to participate by building their own wind and solar power plants. So, yes, it can do both, whereas other systems only can do it one way, and that's the traditional central station model. But the future of, of the electricity supply system in North America is to expand uh, the role of distributed generation, decentralized generation. Uh, the reality is Ontario is looking to uh, build out capacity, generation capacity that is for renewable energy supply and the associated transmission distribution lines to help connect the electricity produced to the people that have to use the electricity. So we've got about 300 different developers in the room online participating in the consultation, collectively developing this new procurement program. Going Green for Green is brought to you by the Royal Bank of Canada. December 17, 2009, Going Green for Green finds itself in Markham, where the Olympic torch relay has arrived here early this morning. And following behind the torch is the RBC Eco Home. Dan from RBC is going to take us for a tour and show us the three different levels highlighted in the Eco Home. Bronze, silver and gold, that Olympic theme. And uh, it's going to show you how you can make your home ener more energy efficient and what RBC is doing to uh, make money available so that you can green your home. We also dragged Camilla from Agate Laboratories out of her lab, and she's on location here today. She loves the parade. She's gonna talk to Kate about uh, sort of the reception of the Eco Home as it's traveled across Canada. We're very happy to be here today with Katie from RBC. We're learning a little bit more about the Eco Home and RBC's involvement with the torch relay. Katie, can you tell us a little bit more about the uh, Eco Home and what you got going on? Yeah, definitely. Um, RBC is here today as a presenting sponsor of the 2010 Olympic Torch Relay. So we've had a really great, unique opportunity to travel across Canada on this 106-day journey. And the vision we have is to create a better Canada. And so the idea is that as we go through communities, we show people a little bit of the small and, and larger changes you can make in your homes that we each can do to create a better Canada along the way. This Eco Home, which was uh, designed by RBC, has been touring around the country and uh, educating people on things they can do to uh, make their home more energy efficient and in so doing help the planet. So Dan uh, is kind of the man in charge of the Eco Home here and he's going to take us for a tour and tell us uh, how it all works. Dan, great. Thanks for uh, taking us in here. Thank you. Uh, welcome to the RBC Creative Governor Canada Experience. Um, we really wanted to take the sustainability piece to the furthest reaches for the entire um, relay. So this actually, in the entire truck is powered by solar heat uh, as well as wind uh, generation. So the, the whole footprint that we have here is powered um, and is off the grid. Um, it's also heated by a solar, uh, solar hot water tank in the ceiling that you'll see later. Um, and it provides radiant heat flooring throughout the entire, the entire exhibit. Um, the first thing we do is we've really broken this down simply for consumers. We've got a bronze, silver, and gold section to kind of show people the path to gold um, and to sustainable living in their home. We start out first by showcasing um, the fact that your home is a, is a polluter. All the homes in Canada equate to about 19 million cars on the road a year. So really just kind of showcasing that, you know, your home is a polluter, but it doesn't have to be that way. And we wanted to kind of take you on the path of gold to show you how to live more sustainably. So really get down to net zero. Okay, so let's see, uh, what can we do here in the bronze section to improve our efficiency? Yeah, sure. For, so in the bronze section here, some of the simplest things that you can do is just replacing light bulbs. So right here we've got a high or a low efficiency bulb and a high efficiency bulb. You know, it's, if, if if everyone changed one light bulb in their house, it's the equivalent of taking 70,000 cars off the road a year. Um, one light bulb, 70,000 cars. Yeah, so it's an interactive exhibit here where you can kind of push some of the buttons. It highlights the, the low efficiency bulb and shows that it's uh, 60 watts being used. You then do the same for the high efficiency bulb. You can see that it's only around 20, 20 watts of so power. So it cuts it by almost uh, 70%, 65%. Exactly, exactly. Wow. Amazing. In addition, we've got other uh, items you can look at in terms of stalling low flow shower heads or low flow um, toilets. You know, again, an interactive exhibit so people can kind of play with this. It's supposed to be fun and interactive at the same time. You turn the knob, the sounds of the shower go on, and you can learn about, you know, that showers account for 19% of water usage in most homes. Same for the, uh, the toilet. You can hear the flush of the toilet. Kids really like that one. <laughs> wow. So 
90% of water usage in most homes. A low flow shower head uses up to 70% less water. Amazing. Absolutely. Amazing. Absolutely. So in, in, when you're coming through the bronze section here, are you finding people really warm to it and open to it? And yeah, it was a great way to get it started because, you know, people are doing these things today. The, the environmental movement is really popular now. Yes. Uh, people are getting on, uh, as I'm sure you're aware of. And people, you know, this is a nice way to kind of warm people up to the whole um, living sustainable um, mode mentality. Check us out online at www.goinggreenforgreen.tv or follow us on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter. Going Green for Green is brought to you by Ontario Electronic Stewardship and RecycleYourElectronics.ca. Okay, well, so let's see silver. Let's see what we can do in silver. Absolutely. Here. So silver is kind of things that require a little bit more investment and a little bit more thought. And obviously right. RBC is, is here to help with that. Um, some of the things you can do are windows. You know, windows are a huge loss of um, heat in your home. So this here is a, an old single pane uh, inefficient window um, that you find in a lot of homes today. And this is a triple pane um, energy star window. Again, this is just a simple radiometer. There's a light that heats it up from behind. You can push on the two exhibits. You'll notice that the, there's more heat escaping through this window. The radiometer's uh, moving quicker. And so the radiometer, so I'm just, I'm not that bright, Dan. You gotta go <laughs> easy on me. So the radiometer, this tells us how much heat is going out the window. Absolutely. These engineers never cease to amaze yeah. me. <laughs> okay, so this one's spinning really fast, so this is our inefficient window. Exactly, more heat is escaping through the, the single pane of the window, and therefore it's uh, spinning a lot faster, because heat, it, it, the heat is what makes that fan go. Cool, cool. Absolutely. So 7% savings, 12% savings, so again, I guess, so as you've got people walking through here, are they are they are they thinking twice in their brains about you know that life cycle cost of if they make the investment in Windows? A absolutely. The first thing that happens is people are amazed by just this, you know the, the heat loss that is happening and realizing right. that they do have these windows, for instance, in their home. So they actually are interested in kind of getting these more kind of sustainable uh, methods installed. Right? For sure. And, and also getting the financial benefits of doing that as well. And I'll tell the viewer, uh, Energy Star, which is you know the the sort of certification for appliances and, and windows and a lot of products around your home. Uh, we're going to be doing a whole episode on Energy Star products and, and um, basically brand names that you can count on to be energy efficient. Anyway, so, all right, so what else can we do in silver before we move to gold? Yeah, I think um, another piece that would be interesting to show you is just the stuff that's hiding behind the uh, foundation of your house. Behind the walls, you know, this is a traditional drain pipe that now has a heat recovery system on it. So this is an actual coil of copper wire that wraps around your drainage pipes. So when hot water comes through the sink, it heats up the coil pipes, and that heat is redirected back to your water tank to, to recycle the heat. So again, another wow. way, you can get about 70% um, uh, savings uh, for your water heating costs. From your water heating costs in this. Unbelievable. Mm -hmm. So that's a great, uh, and then the tankless hot water system, again, if you, if you uh, are looking to get a new um, water heating system, you can get rid of the, uh, the old fashioned system and go to tankless. And again, right. a, tank, a tank, tankless is kind of heat on the moment, heat when you need it. Right. To minimize waste. Amazing, amazing. Absolutely. Okay, and I mean, you know, uh, again, for the viewer, like it or not, Price of energy is going to go up, and uh, you got to start doing what you can around your house to uh, to cut your energy usage and become more efficient. So we are now moving into the gold section. Dan, let us give us the. So this is the this is the the gold medal of efficiency. It is the gold medal of efficiency. Um, essentially, here it's it's really moving into things that require a lot of financial planning. So it it is you know it's wind power, it's solar power um, on your roof. Uh, it's geothermal heating. Geothermal is when essentially um, they use the heating and cooling of the the, the earth right. to kind of warm and cool your house. Uh, and two large pipes are installed deep down into um, your your land, and the heat the natural heating and cooling of uh, the earth is brought into your home. Uh, wow. Another big piece as well is... Uh, and, and just, again, so yep. so what? how much would this power a windmill this size? Uh, a windmill that's what you've that got size, on the roof here, right? It's actually what we have on the roof right now. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it, it ranges because it depends on how much wind you get in your area, so it fluctuates. Uh, sure. But, you know, the wind alone can definitely offset. It can't... One of those could not... Uh, power your entire house. Right. But combined with um, some solar power, absolutely. There's absolutely so, no and, problem. And, and what, 
so what do you what will this generate here? Like, what do you run off of the? You, are you charging batteries? Yeah, absolutely. So, so you're right charging now, batteries with this on the roof here. Exactly, exactly. So we have 12 battery banks inside this truck. Right. Um, that all the all the solar and all the wind power generates to to, to power that. Um, right. And then and then once it's uh, once it's powered up um, to the max, it'll it'll it'll, 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 it'll just stay static. But if this was your home, you can actually sell that energy that you collect back onto the grid and actually make money off of it. Once everybody's gone through it, they've gone through bronze, silver, gold today, you know, tomorrow, planning for the future. It's just kind of a reminder of everything you can do. So consumers can actually go on, step on the bronze, and you'll hear the cheering of the actual crowd, and it highlights the bronze elements, so low flow fixtures, uh, efficient lighting. You know, again, if when you step on the gold or the silver, you hear the sound, the cheer wow. of the crowd a little louder. And he talks about better insulation, Energy Star windows, drain uh, water recovery, Energy Star appliances. Okay, you step on the gold, Dan. I mean, <laughs> go for the gold. <laughs> so that's your solar and your wind and your geothermal. Absolutely. Is this the best we can do? Of course not. We can do better. Think about it. You know, centralized power. So we build these massive power plants that produce power. And then we have the, have the distribution grid, which, you know, the hydro lines carry that power to where it's needed. It's kind of crazy. Um, you know, certainly back in the day, it was the only solution that we had. But now, as we're looking at solar and wind and all these alternative energy uses, you, the individual, has to become your own power supplier. And if you can produce enough power to do three loads of laundry a day and watch TV for three or four hours a day, great. If you can't, let's hope that we learn how to live within our means, because that's what it's really about. Today on Sustainably Speaking, we find ourselves back at the boardwalk at Ashbridge's Bay. Today we're talking to the folks that we meet about the Lake Ontario, their relationship with the lake, whether or not they swim in Lake Ontario, whether they eat the fish from Lake Ontario, and how important the lake is to them and their life here in Toronto. Have you ever swam in Lake Ontario? Yes, recently, yesterday I did. Uh, no, no, never have. No, never have. I, like my mom tells me not to because she says like you can get ear infections but and like eye infections, but like I do it anyways. I have swum in Lake Ontario. It's nice and refreshing. You go down on like a hot day or something and you just need it sometimes. And do you guys ever eat fish from the lake? Not that I know of. Yeah, I don't think so. No? My dad always comments on how uh, the fish would glow in the dark at night, but he's usually joking, so <laughs> I probably would eat it. Yeah, I would eat it. What, what can you tell them about, about how we should treat this lake? Uh, not to pollute it, take advantage of it, uh, swim more, it's cleaner than what we've been led to believe. You can't swim on these days, so a lot of people are like, oh, I don't know if I can swim today, I don't know if it's a good idea. So it's just kind of built up that stigma that I guess people have. When you talk about your generation using the lake more, why do you think that is? Um, probably because our parents didn't use it as much and we kind of want to take advantage of it now and we want to protect it for our kids and future generations because we realize how much fun we have whenever we're down here and we want our kids to experience that as well. It's out of sight and out of mind What is the state of our humankind And I don't know what to say Cause we produce more every day And we call it garbage 